Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 93 of the CU Insight Experience. This episode is brought to you by Trellence, from data to insight the right way. My name is Randy Smith. I am one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and it is my job on the show to have conversations with the best and the brightest of the credit union community. I get to pick their brains and see if we can't find a few nuggets that we can all learn from. My guest on today's show is Shruti Miyashiro. Shruti is the president and CEO of Orange County's credit union. This was my first chance to have a conversation with Shruti, and, and I, I sure hope it isn't my last. Uh, there were so many rabbit holes that I, that I had to keep myself from going down or we would have been talking for hours. Uh, we talked about keeping teams connected in this ever-changing world we're all going through and how to maintain the credit union's culture and mission. Shruti explained why creating a culture of growth for employees is so important to her and the credit union. We, we talked about what credit unions overall need to do to stay relevant with all the disruption going on around us in financial services from philosophy student to CEO. Shruti shares with us her path uh, through most areas of, of the credit union, quite honestly, uh, to where she is today and there were just a ton of leadership lessons learned along the way that that she was willing to share with all of us today uh, as always we had some fun with the rapid fire questions to wrap up the whole show this was a blast for me uh, I, I hope it will be for you too so without further ado i give you my conversation with shruti enjoy shruti welcome to the show delighted to be here thank you I was excited to have you on. And as I was doing some homework, I got even more excited. So there, there's a lot for us to talk about today. And I, I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks again. I, I'd like to start with someplace that I've kind of started the show the last uh, few weeks is, you know, we're all living through interesting times right now. One, I don't think any of us are 100 years old and have that experience of a global pandemic before. But and there's so much going on, not only at the credit union, but outside the credit union as well in all of our lives. Have you found any hacks to, you know, kind of keep your team feeling connected? And, you know, most people's like, kids are back in school now, all that type of stuff. A lot of homeschooling going on that we never were planned for. Have you found anything that's working to keep your, your folks all together and, and connected? Isn't it amazing how much life has changed just in the last few months? Yep. Um, when we think of where we were in 2019 of September compared to now, it's unbelievable how much has changed. Absolutely. And I think where our society has shifted from fear, unknown, just these feelings of confusion, people are now shifting to, I think it's going to be like this for a while. And so we don't know what's ahead, but we've now we've come to accept that we don't know what's ahead. And so as a result of that, I think our teams are going back into habits, but just shifted them a little. So our credit union, for example, has a big culture of communication, transparency, a lot of connecting. So in the past where I would have, for example, CEO listening sessions with all of our team members, now we're doing them virtually. And sometimes they're very difficult as people are holding a phone up in the branches and talking to each other, but it's still happening. So what has happened now is we're not changing what was important to us, communication, connecting. We're changing how we're doing that. It's much more intentional and so we continue our um, CEO listening sessions. I've added some quick, short, skip level meetings. Okay. Uh, I'm starting to add a hangout at a certain time coming in October. We'll have a hangout. Here's a CEO. Join this meeting if you feel like it. Let's just hang out as if you were meeting in the lunchroom. Yep. At a certain time. So um, what we're simply changing is the way we connect, not the connecting itself. And we're having some fun now. We've moved again from that time of fear and uncertainty to this is how it is. How do we make the most of it? So we've introduced things like workplace for businesses or Friday faces, scavenger hunts. Okay. <laughs> lots of things to make sure the culture stays in place. That's the most important thing in this environment. You know, I, that question, issue, uh, whatever, however you want to put it, has been one of the things that keeps coming up in conversations that I've been having with uh, other leaders and CEOs and even a couple networking groups I'm a part of is nobody thinks that like we're necessarily going to go 100% back to the way things were. 
but the the big question keeps coming up around, but we want to maintain that culture that maybe we've been building for years in a kind of a little bit different environment, even after we're past this pandemic. So yeah, those are some great hacks that, that you just said there that I think a lot of people will take something from, that's for sure. When you look back personally over the past few months, how have you grown as a leader? Well, tremendously, because we had, I had two things going on, Randy. I had, uh, of course, the pandemic that everyone faced. But also, I've been at Orange County's Credit Union since 2007, and I was very fortunate to have the exact same team, executive team, in place for 11 of those years. However, starting in February of last year was the first wave of retirements. Uh So between February 25th of 2019 to September 3rd of 2020, I've actually had four of my five direct reports retire. Wow. (laughs) So change has been absolutely in the air at our credit union as our entire executive team has turned over. And then we faced the pandemic together as a team. And so uh, tremendous growth for me as an individual. One of my favorite quotes is from the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. And he says he'd much rather have a team of learn-it-alls rather than a team of know-it-alls. So the good news is I've never thought I was a know-it-all. I've always known there's more for me to learn, whether it's a pandemic or anything else. And then the other thing I've had to really learn and step back is assess my own leadership style, what worked for the original team members that were here when I arrived and stayed for 11 years. And now we've got a new team and what are their needs and how can I be effective for them? So very important for me not to be complacent as a leader of new people, but also during a pandemic. And so I have had a lot to learn because I did not know it all. (laughs) I have to follow up on that because there are a lot of, my guess is there's quite a few CEOs. We all, well, back when we could travel, we went to conferences and things like that. Many of the folks in the C-suite, let's just say, are closer to retirement. Um, So I I have a feeling there's going to be quite a few CEOs over the next few years that are probably in a similar boat as you, where you do see senior leadership turnover, um, you know, uh, underneath you, anything that like, if somebody else is going through that or just at the start of that, anything you would share with them, any tips after four out of your five, uh, you know, having to be replaced. Yeah. After four out of five changed. Uh, one of the things after I got over my initial, uh, terror moment of fear, (laughs) terror, (laughs) really you're retiring. Are you sure? (laughs) You never want great people to leave, but they really do go on to do other things in life. So (laughs) after the moment of fear, um, I think one of the best things we did is we worked with an executive coach. We had, we were very lucky that we had a cohort starting around the same time, right? Of these four people within about a year and a half of each other. And we knew that. So we um, had a co um, um, a series of executive coaches who talked about our leadership brand as an executive team. And we have a team called the alignment team. So instead of the senior management team, we call it the alignment team, because I think that's one of the most important things leaders are doing is creating alignment within an organization. Um, and so our alignment team worked with these coaches on a number of um, topics from what's our brand? What is our promise to each other as peers? How do we make decisions? What frameworks do we use like rapid and racy? A lot of these things that maybe happen magically in an organization, but they're not always codified. And an agreement of the types of decisions that we make, others make, um, an honest assessment of where we are as individuals. We did 360s. Those 360s remained with the coach and the individual, they never came to me. They never came to human resources. We want each person to be the best version of themselves as a leader. Um, but then we also talk about what are our shared strengths and our expectations of what it means to be an executive. What are um, leadership fundamentals? So we went through a lot of work together as a team to come together quickly to make sure that we have trust, connection, a shared vision, a shared purpose, and alignment. And we'll still continue to work on that. There's never a finish um, place because we'll have new people on the team and we'll continue to evolve. But I would say without a doubt, that very intentional plan of new people coming in, bringing new talent to us, and then how do we still not lose the culture and some of the things that worked well as we continue to also get better? 
Absolutely. That's good stuff there. I, one of the things doing some homework, I noticed that was kind of seemed to keep popping up was this idea that like you really want to instill the like a growth culture inside the credit union. You want to give people that opportunity to grow their careers. That seems like you just had to really put that to the test here over the past few months. But uh, why is that, I guess, so important to you when you look at it all the way up and down the, you know, the, the organization? Yeah. Well, I think there's, you know, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? I think there is also a need somewhere in there for people to feel like we have a purpose and we made an impact. The time we spent was well spent. And so that is important for me to be able to give that to our associates. And I'll be the first to admit that I don't know if I'm tough to work for, but I definitely know I have high expectations and this excitement about what can be done and what we can accomplish. And um, so with that, I hope that we're doing great things together. I really have a vision and a belief that we want the very best people working at our credit union, the ones the recruiters approach all the time, try to steal them away from our organization, the one the peers in the industry are calling to say, how did you do that because of their amazing success? So we want the very best people working here that people want to steal, but the people working here love it so much they can't be stolen. They want to stay here because of the culture and what we're building together. And so that's why growth and development is important to me because with that, we continue to have an impact and a purpose. And so that's why we look at things differently. I know a lot of organizations will have tuition reimbursement programs, for example. And we have shifted that from a tuition reimbursement program to a grant program and associates will apply for it several times a year. And it can be for certifications. It can be for a workshop. It can be for a class. Because travel and conference budgets, when they're set by the company, don't always get to the nitty gritty of what someone wants to go. That. And so it's open at all levels in the organization. And it is not just for a degree or tuition. It's for your own personal professional growth and development. I think that's a, that is a great idea. And the first I've heard of that, I was just having a conversation with Jill over the weekend and we were talking about how like there are so many, cause we were doing some hiring for CU insight and th that skill set isn't necessarily always the college degree or going to get the MBA at this point, right? Like there's so many specialized things that people can do to add value to their careers. So that's a, Fantastic. I, I absolutely love that. We might we might need to work that into our structure as well. <laughs> Something I was excited to ask you about was like even before the pandemic, we were seeing a lot of disruption in financial services. I've said it on the show before. I, I think we've all kind of admitted it. Credit unions in the past sometimes were very slow to move <laughs> and to change. But over the past year, it's been amazing what's been accomplished, right? Uh, when we kind of had to do things. Is there something that you think credit unions need to do fundamentally different to stay competitive in this this uh, ever-changing financial services world that, that we all swim in? Yeah, long before COVID, and probably this is something people hear me say all the time, the beauty of credit unions is that we are so collaborative and we share and we work together. My fear is that it could make us complacent and fall into groupthink where we don't know how to formulate our own strategies and ideas. And so what we want to take is the beauty of what we have together, this collaboration, the sharing, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's, let's move forward together as an industry with a purpose. But on the flip side, each business, including our own credit unions, needs to look at who they are, who we serve, why we're here, and what we're doing and why we're doing it. So our business model as a community credit union is not necessarily the right business model for someone who is very seg-based in a different geography, perhaps. So I think it's important to discern that. And so when I look at, you know, when I look at dynamic times like this, COVID and the agility that's needed, we're looking at change multiple ways. We're looking at first, I think, start with appreciative inquiry. What is working well? Don't mess it up. And that is <laughs> such an important component of any new um, environment. Then looking at what needs to be enhanced. It's working well, but how do we keep iterating it, keep it improving? And then identifying what is broken. That if we don't fix this, it's like an ICU situation. If yeah. we don't fix this, the patient's going to die. The business is going to die. This is not a good idea. 
And then for executives, you know, we've got to be able to synthesize all of these things all over the place quickly, honestly. It takes some good self introspection, organizational introspection, and then knowing how to prioritize. Um, so there's there's a lot to this, and it all has to happen, as you said, in a pandemic environment <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> right. yeah. we, we don't have a strategic planning session in a year yeah, to get this so done. We have to get it done in three weeks, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, this great book that I read that helped me with this, and it's called um, Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay. And that book was very helpful at this idea of how do you think quickly? How do you make snap decisions? And how do you take some time to process? And what are the different ways your brain does that? We love books on the podcast. So we will link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, last question in this first section of the show. If we were to sit down a year from now, what are you most proud of that you and your team at Orange County's Credit Union have accomplished? If you could break out that foggy crystal ball for us. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, you basically what does success look like a year yep. from now? And um, I think my answer to that is, Success will be when our people tell us that they were relieved to have us by their side during this crisis. Like Success that. will be when our associates can say they felt safe, they trusted us, our members. We all know we work together at every level to make this time in our credit union's history something that we proudly weather. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, so on to the second part of the show, the leadership and life facts. Just kind of go back to... 2007, what inspired you to, to take the gig as president and CEO of the credit union? It definitely wasn't the title. I had worked at this credit union before that in 1999. So I knew this credit union very well as a vice president when I was here. I knew the culture. I knew the values. And that was the most attractive piece of being able to come back here. The thing with the CEO job, at least in my view, Randy, is that any focus on yourself must disappear. <laughs> Hopefully long before you have a CEO title, but definitely by the time you get the CEO title, it's no longer about yourself. The entire job is about what the stakeholders need. And so that is exciting and scary at the same time. But um, that was the excitement as I became more comfortable in my role as a CEO. That purpose and that clarity of why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do has really helped energize me uh -huh. all along. And so here I am, gosh, from 2007 to 2020, and I feel like I'm still in my honeymoon period. Uh, that's beautiful. A that's, a, that's a good place to be. I, it's so interesting. A couple of different things there. So often people on this podcast who, you know, most are CEOs, that's one of the things that they kind of wish they learned earlier was that idea that it's not just, you know, sometimes we all move up our careers quickly because we are that kind of a per type personality who's a go getter and you go do things. And then all of a sudden you get to the leadership position and it's like, you need to raise all boats, right? Like uh, <laughs> that's it. And see the bigger picture. It can't just be you putting your head down and doing the job. Right. And uh, I can't even say I'm surprised anymore by how many people talk about that as being one of those kind of younger struggles, right? <laughs> like that you just have to learn and the sooner that's so that's, that's great advice right there. The other question I have from that is it sounds like, so you left the credit union for a while. That's been an interesting, you know, 90 some episodes in now of this, there, there's kind of that mix of folks, right? Who some of them grew up from teller all the way to CEO. Others, they felt they had to leave to go get some different experiences to become a CEO. Um, you know, it, was that something when you left before you had the opportunity to come back? Was that something that you felt you needed to do to get that maybe some more experience or for a better opportunity? Or what was the... It, um, you know, I'm a very curious person. So Randy, my undergrad degree was in philosophy. So at okay. this stage, I'm just lucky to not be unemployed. Right? <laughs> unemployment options for a philosophy major. <laughs> but it sounds like we could have some amazing conversations. So right. that's a, I, I find that exciting, actually. So, <laughs> Well, I loved it. Um, I ended up getting a more credible MBA, um, you know, down the road. But I loved it. And I think you can see that in my career path. It's always been very deep in credit unions, but it was all over the place. Operations, lending, human resources, training, I mean, starting e-business over here, enterprise risk management. So CEO of a um, investment services QSO. So this interest and curiosity about everything in the world, I yes. think, <laughs> permeated my career. And one of my wonderful mentors, Judy McCartney, always encouraged me to go out and be a CEO. Uh -huh. You know, she, it's, 
I think there's always that moment for those of us who become CEOs, nine times out of 10, there's someone who believed in us more than we ever thought that would be our path in life. Isn't that the truth, it was yeah. not as though there was a plan at age 18 coming out of college to be a CEO. <laughs> right. So I think the CEO job prior in between working here at Orange County's credit union, CEO at a credit union in Pasadena, and then coming back to Orange County's credit union was without a doubt this gift of mentors that we have, especially in our industry. That is the truth. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit there because it segues well. Um, that mentors, you know, that was a big thing in the first season of people talking about mentors. So I always I wanted to add a question. And personally, I, I feel this way, and I know many do as well. And it sounds like you do too. Is mentors and that professional network are so important to our careers? How have these relationships benefited your career? So it's a gift, again, in our industry that we have individuals who will mentor and we have networks, conferences, meetings, groups where we can find our own mentors. And I have an interesting twist on this because we think of mentors as people. And I could give you hands and feet worth of names um, where we've got people who've influenced my career. And there's formal mentors and there's informal mentoring. And I've always had informal but really, um, when we pause to think about it, mentoring is about learning from someone else. And so sometimes the mentee is teaching the mentor yeah, if absolutely. there's a real openness and honesty with that. But oftentimes we're learning from everything. We're learning from the book we read. We're learning how someone we don't even know handled a difficult situation. So this idea of needing a mentor to succeed in life, I think, can be um, limiting. The idea of a gift of a mentor in life is wonderful, and it is a gift. Not everybody has a formal program, but the idea that we can find opportunities to learn and find our own mentors, so to speak, whether they're books, a podcast like this, anything, is, um, there really is no limit to the ways that we can learn. Uh, absolutely. Uh I am with you. Constantly learning and growing. So how would you describe your leadership style? I've always said it's important to have humility. Okay. Yep. Very important to never think you have arrived and are finished and are the perfect leader. I think, though, you need confidence without arrogance also, because if humility leads you to stop learning and growing and you remain in a place of fear, that can be dangerous. But more important is that without arrogance part, um, without a doubt. I hope that I'm honest and transparent. I hope that I learn from people, maybe more than they learn from me, because going back to that not wanting to be a know-it-all. Yep. And I hope that most importantly, I'm the type of leader who recognizes, again, it's not about me. It's about the other people, the stakeholders. And so what I'm doing is improving myself every day, I hope, to be better for them. Uh, that's good stuff. Is there something your team or the people around you have heard you say so many times they can finish your sentence? Yeah, hopefully they won't roll their eyes as they're finishing my sentences. <laughs> but absolutely, our team, um, the word alignment comes up all the time. I um, believe very strongly that there's three elements when you're a leader and when you're in a CEO position, you're looking at strategy, alignment, and execution. And average strategies are okay if they're very well aligned and executed. Yeah. And certainly everybody is very busy doing something all the time in an organization. But if it doesn't align with the strategy, it's not always as useful. So alignment is a word um, that is repeated over and over again. I'm always trying to draw connections um, between things. I think they certainly know we talk about our stakeholders a lot. Members, associates, community. That is who we exist for. And uh, it's a people-driven stakeholder model since it is not for profit and uh, not publicly traded. And looking at things from our members' experience, um, looking at things from their perspective to transform the banking experience. Those are a few phrases that I hope are really embedded in our <laughs> that, culture. That they're hearing all the time, right? So is there a common myth about being a good leader that you would want to debunk? I, you know, would you mind if I rephrase the question to say is there a common myth about leadership that yep. I want to debunk? Because there is a common myth about leadership. 
And that is that title matters. It is so not true in my value system that the fact that someone can have a title and their value or worth in our society are correlated is not true. And so success is knowing what's important to you and your values and aligning your life that way. But success is not having a CEO title and it is not reaching a salary. It is about doing good for others. And I think there is a lot of worth that's given to CEOs and other leaders as if they are somehow smarter or more successful or know something that the rest of the world doesn't know. Have all the answers, right? (laughs) After that um, humility, absolutely. Lack of arrogance comes in. It simply isn't true. And no one should think because they don't have a CEO title or a senior or a VP or a manager title somehow they haven't achieved success. So the the myth that I want to debunk in leadership is that the title somehow insinuates that you are a better person or even a leader. Or a leader at all, yeah. Influential leader without the title at all levels. I was looking forward to asking you this question. When you think back to earlier in your career, was there a mistake that you made? Or is, you know, maybe that mistake that... Now that you've been in the CEO position for quite some time, that you see young leaders when maybe when they're getting that first crack at management, right? Like that they you see people make over and over. Yeah. I don't know that it's a mistake people are making, but I know it's a skill set that's not as developed. Um, I have seen in our world. And that is that ability to think crit- critically and holistically. Yeah. The ability to plan and prioritize and execute are very difficult. And I don't know that we in organizations or in our world allow time for that. Yeah. And I think um, no matter what your role is, no matter what your title is, the ability to do that, to synthesize information and make sense of it, and then somehow organize it to say, this is what we're doing and why is really hard. Yeah, I agree. in our industry where we're so collaborative. So what we think we should do is just what the credit union next door is doing or the bank across the street is doing. Yep. It's such an interesting thing. Like how much of that comes from experience, right? Um, we're, you're, we're probably similar ages. Um, and I just wonder like at 30, did we have the experience and the capacity to know that maybe, right? Like um, <laughs> You're absolutely right. That wisdom that comes from experience and in the absence of experience, though, we still get to look at what the world's doing. Absolutely. We have, and we don't have to look at the credit union only or the bank. We can also look at how nations are guiding government policy and public policy. There's a world full of information. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I, I It always surprises people that I, from a CU Insight perspective, I pay very little attention to what people assume are our competitors. Because I'm like, what can I learn from CNN or with this or, you know what I mean? Like I look, I try to look outside the industry. So you're speaking my language there. I like that. Uh, has there been a piece of advice or a life lesson that you received maybe when you were younger that you find yourself going back to over and over in your career? Yeah, it was, um, it ties into what my dad said. So my dad always said this idea of when you're climbing the ladder of success, always you make sure you don't step on the hand of the person below you. You lend a helping hand. But my favorite quote is from um, Muriel Siebert, who was the first woman to have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, yeah. And her, the gist of it is, when you see a closed door, rear back and kick it in. <laughs> but leave it open for others so they can follow. And this idea of not being afraid of what's out there and going for it with full gusto, but always seeing who you can bring along with you always doing it together. You know, so I, this wasn't in the questions that I sent you, but I think it goes into that. So I hope you don't mind me diverting a little bit is I like, I have tried to keep DEI front and center on the show. And so often we hear that, right? Like even if somebody kicks through the door, maybe it's shut. I mean, I I quite honestly, I'd never heard that quote before, but (laughs) the idea that like, how often is the door kicked open, but then shut, right? So it's like, Oh, nope, somebody's here. So that's, that's enough. Right. I'm sure you've faced roadblocks along the way. It, it, any any advice for up and comers, you know, for people that are trying to kick through that door themselves? I, For me, um, as I was building my career, 
the good news is I think I was blissfully unaware of how <laughs> challenging things would be. I had no idea when I was in the industry for five years working at a credit union that was probably 50 million in assets. Yeah. And I was a vice president there. I had no idea that did not make me qualified to be a vice president at a billion dollar organization because I applied for that job. <laughs> and not because I thought I was phenomenal. It was because I was blissfully clueless that I did not have the skill set to do that. And as a result, I, I applied for the job. I didn't get the job, but I built some great connections and I learned. And that was really my entry into credit unions. I did not plan on a career in credit unions. I had a branch manager tell me that she was moving to a different role and I should apply for her position. And at that moment, I knew I was not qualified because I'd only been in the industry maybe six months. Okay. And I was really planning a career in hospital administration. However, she told me to apply. I knew in that case I wasn't qualified, but I also was not afraid of rejection. Yeah. I thought I would just learn how to interview for a grown-up job. Right. <laughs> and and here I am with a career all these years later. And so I think the advice um, in life, not just as you're building your career, is don't let the thing scare you. Make take that what scares us, let's take the time to now study it and understand it and be qualified to meet it as opposed to running away from it. That, that seems to fit into your growth mindset very well, right? Like, to, yeah. so <laughs> I'm seeing a reoccurring theme here. <laughs> um, it's pretty consistent here. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> Before we uh, move on to the last part of the show, if you have a free day, nothing on the calendar, what do you what do you do outside of credit unions to unwind? And you know, what does that work life integration look like to you? My my happiest days are when I start early in the morning. I, you know, 5 a.m. I'm definitely a morning lark. I love being up early. The world is still quiet. I can take a moment to read. I can take a moment to just be and plan ahead. So those are my happiest days. If it's outside of the credit union and there's nothing else going on, then um, no TV is a joyful day for me. My husband loves his TV and I love him. So the TV's <laughs> on. But when there's no TV on, I'm um, delighted. And then connecting with the people I love. That's yeah. always important. Some time for exercise. And I'm, I'm a simple girl, Randy. I just like the idea of a... A good life filled with good people. Uh, that's a beautiful thing to have, right? <laughs> so um, on to the last part of the show, the rapid fire questions. The questions are rapid. Your answers do not have to be. Uh, what were you like in high school? And do you remember the first time you got into memorable trouble? <laughs> well, I was so unremarkable, uh, Randy. I was not the valedictorian. I was not a star athlete. I was not musically talented. I also wasn't a troublemaker. Okay. Um, yeah. So I don't remember getting in big trouble in um, high school, but I was really kind of this average honor student, a handful of super close friends kind of trying to figure out this whole uh, <laughs> teenage life and what it all meant. And there was nothing remarkable or memorable about me. And yet I think I was like every other teenager uh, at the time. <laughs> I think that was most of us, right? So um, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned, didn't think the credit union was going to be the career choice, right? Like I want to go into the medical side of things. Um, most of us did stumble into credit unions, quite honestly, right? So what did you want to be when you're in high school? What did you want to be when you grew up? So again, never knowing, always changing. Yeah. I went from wanting to be a doctor to realizing that chemistry was not my favorite class. So that quickly shifted to, I think I'll be a psychologist, which then shifted my freshman year to, wow, political science is really fascinating. I think I'll do something with political science. Well, poli sci 20 wasn't as fun as poli sci 10. Let's go to philosophy. And um, that's, and then it became, you better stick with a major and graduate on time. You're like philosophy um, seems fun. Be a lawyer, uh, yeah. be a hospital administrator. I thought the world was my oyster. And yet I just didn't know what to do with that pearl. That is so good. Uh, but do, do you have any daily routines that if you just don't do your day feels off? It's my nighttime routine. Okay. I have uh, been with my um, husband, my high school or college sweetheart since I was 21. And I am um, it's the silliest little thing. But every night we go to bed with a kiss and a hug. 
And it's just a habit. Um, and we've done that every day of our lives together, except when we're traveling. And it closes the day on a good note. All is well. Um, that you know, the the person who I am so happy to spend the rest of my life with is is there and all is good. Oh, you're making me smile. That's that is fantastic. <laughs> I love that answer. Um, the random question, what's the best album of all time? That one you can uh, listen to without skipping a song. Classic rock, always a classic rock girl. So I would have to say Queen's greatest hits. I love Queen. That's you know, maybe a little bit of Simon and Garfunkel. If I go back to the seventies, though, I really love Simon and Garfunkel too. <laughs> Surprisingly, I think that might be the first time Queen's been mentioned on the show. So that's a that's when you said it, I'm like that's a good pick. That's awesome. <laughs> you mentioned a book earlier. Uh, Jill and I are both readers. We have stacks of books all over the house that many are from recommendations on this show. Is there a book that either you've gifted others or just one that you think everybody should read? Today, because of what's happening in our society and all that we're going through, um, The Color of Law is a fantastic read. It talks about law and how it has shaped home ownership in um, the U.S. and how home ownership is normally the way wealth is created. Absolutely. Yeah, for most people. So that's a fascinating read. I think in general, books like that um, about how the world is the way it is. There's another book called Capital in the 21st Century. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so those are like when you talk about books, maybe everyone should read. I think it's this idea of why is the world the way it is? Yeah. And particularly as CEOs and in this case, leaders. What made it that way and what do we want it to be? And what's our role in that? Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting. I've, I've talked before in this conversation I've had with many people is that idea of generational wealth. It, most of the time it started from home ownership, right? Like that's the thing that's passed down more than almost anything else. So yeah, that's, oh. that's uh, I, I think you just added to my book list. So, <laughs> cause that is not a book I've read as you've gotten older. What's become more important to you? And my favorite part of this question, what's become less important? Yeah. Uh, most important, without a doubt, is is this idea of purpose, right? We all want to have a meaningful life. And so what that means to each of us, uh, time with our family, volunteering, if it's faith, whatever drives each of us. But this idea of purpose and the fact that we spent a lot of time with people in places, with our family, our loved ones, our friends, uh, co-workers, all of that time spent with people in the various places um, should have been impactful and fun too. We should have a good time leading this life. And that I think is what I really realized is um, just this ability to do good and have others feel good. Uh, That's beautiful. What's the flip side? What's become less important? It's hard when you're always striving to think of anything that's less important. <laughs> and it's hard when you're curious by nature to think anything isn't important. I, 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 I know others who answer that way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, this is what I know is less important. The 18 year old in me thought having a BMW was important. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the 18 year old in me thought the salary I made was important. The no longer far from 18 year old person in me realizes that those material possessions are not important. And all the other stuff is. Yeah, absolutely. So that ties into a question that I didn't send you, but I know you've listened to the show, so I don't know if you prepared for this or not. But when you hear the word success, who is the first person that comes to mind? Um, this is success to me. It's the janitor you read about in the news who didn't make any money, relatively speaking. Yep. Did not have a title that we would necessarily strike for in life. But the one who reached out and connected every day with the students in the school, the teachers, the administrators, made a difference in their lives, who was frugal, who saved and invested. And upon his death, had millions of dollars that he gave back to society. It's the silent heroes who, the people who have a purpose in life that transcends themselves 
and who are the silent heroes, not the ones looking for attention, not the ones looking for glory, the ones who quietly go about doing things that change the world. Those are my heroes. That's who I think is most successful. The reason I love that question so much is because we all define it differently, right? And what success is. So it's a I, that fantastic answer there. That was a good one. That made me smile too. So you've been doing that a lot on the, with your answers. I love it. <laughs> um, thank you again, Shruti, for being on the show today. I, I will link to everything that we talked about in the show notes. The last question that I have for you is, do you have any final asks of our listeners or, or final thoughts you'd like to share? I think we live in remarkable times. We live and work in an industry that is so meaningful. And we have the privilege that so many people don't have. People go a lifetime wondering what they're going to do in life and what they want to be when they grow up. And if we have fallen, most of us accidentally, into this industry at this time, so much is changing in our world and in our nation. The things we can do are enormous. And my ask would be that we don't forget that as we move forward in life. That is the perfect way to wrap this up. If people have additional questions of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? LinkedIn, the Twitter machine, email, what's your poison? I am probably the only CEO in the world who is not on LinkedIn. Ah, <laughs> so it must be the email. <laughs> old fashioned email. I love connecting with people. I spent plenty of time in my career reaching out, learning from people I didn't even know. So I always welcome that, but it's the old school email. Well, we will make sure people can get a hold of you there too. Thank you again so much, Rudy, for being on the show. I hope you stay well and healthy and have an amazing day. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Before we go, I would once again like to thank all of you for listening. We, we couldn't have this much fun doing what we do without you. So thank you very much. Uh, also, a big thank you to Shruti for taking the time out of her busy schedule to share her experiences with all of us. And a big thank you to our new sponsor. Trellens. Uh, our friends at Trellens have been longtime partners of us at CU Insight and supporters of ours. So please make sure to click on the link in the show notes, show them some love, see how they are transforming data into actionable insights for credit unions from coast to coast. Uh, once again, to wrap it all up, don't forget about the CU Insight Experience podcast book list. Need some stimulation for the old mind? We've got you covered. Get your next book recommendation from the guests on our show. Thank you all again for listening. Have a great day and please stay healthy, friends. Mm -hmm.